Good morning and welcome to today's webcast. Topic of our webcast today is COVID-19 tax provisions accelerating cash flow for real estate owners and operators. First, we'd like to bring to everybody's attention um, our disclaimer in terms of our webinar. Uh, in connection with the information we're providing is general information only. It does not constitute any legal tax advice, or accounting service or investment advice or professional consulting of any kind. The information herein uh, should not be used as a substitute for consultation with the appropriate and competent advisors. Before making a decision and taking any action, you should consult a, a competent advisor with, with, with respect to your pertinent tax, excuse me, facts and circumstances. My name is George Lovanos. I am a tax partner with the accounting firm Sachs LLP and a member of our real estate practice group. I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists today, Michael Bengigi. Come on. Today, we plan to cover the following points in connection with our webinar. We're gonna go through the postponement of certain tax filings and payments that I'm sure everyone's aware of. We're gonna cover certain time-sensitive actions for certain uh, transactions, including, but not limited to, like-kind exchange and qualified opportunity zone relief. We plan to cover the new provisions that affect cash flow for our, our real estate owner operators that could be available to them through net operating loss carrybacks. We're going to discuss the qualified improvement property quote unquote retail glitch fix that was constituted as part of the CARES Act. And we're going to go into the business interest limitation considerations. There will be other items that we also want to direct you in terms that, of your cash flow and how they could be impacted. With that, I would like to introduce again my, fe my fellow panelist, Michael Bengigi, is a senior tax manager with our firm to start our program. Michael? George, thank you so much. Everybody, good morning. I hope everybody's doing well during this time. Um, we put a slide deck together to give our, our real estate clients um, some guidance in terms of what's going on out there in, in, in from a tax perspective and how we can plan to accelerate some cash flow through some of the reliefs that, we're, that, we're, uh, that, that we have out there. So with that, um, on April 11, 2020, it's been a little more than a month ago, President Trump approved major disaster declarations for all 50 states, D.C., and certain U.S. Um, in certain in certain U.S. territories regarding COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first time ever that all the state that all states have been declared a federal disaster at the same time. Even a little bit of prior to that, the IRS recognized that they needed to extend. And again, when I say extend, I mean move the original deadline for certain tax filing and, sen and time sensitive actions that George has mentioned before. Um, so filing a payment. Have been post has been postponed, postponed, which would have been originally due April 15, are now due July 15. And performance of certain time-sensitive actions, which we're going to talk about in our next few present slides, has been moved from what would, would have been due April 1st through July 15, has now moved to July 15. So here's a partial list. Individual income tax return filings, corporate return filings, and estates and trust filings, plus your 2019 tax amount due that would have been uh, filed by April 15, have now been pushed to July 15. Plus, 2020 first and second quarter payments, all now due in July 15. We have mentioned before, most of our, our clients who are aware of this, we're just going over um, that point. What was not covered um, was our partnership and S corporation deadlines that were due March 16, 2020. Those were not postponed, those deadlines. But there's an exception to that partnership and S corporations that are due between April 1st and July 15, those deadlines have been postponed to July uh, to July 15. The states responded in, in mostly in uniform when it comes to the 2019 personal income taxes that were originally due April 15. Most states have followed federal, moved it to July 15 or some other deadline. Let's cover some of the states in the, in the tri-state area, New York, personal income tax and corporation taxes, including fiduciaries, estates, and trusts. Those have been extended to July 15. New York City, un unincorporated business tax, that's a tax for uh, non-corporated flow-through entities and general corporation tax. 
uh, New York City activity. Filing and payment also extended to July 15. However, payments that are made after um, April 15, there will be an interest charge. So that's a nuance out there. New Jersey extends filing and payment for the individual gross income tax, partnership and corporation business tax to July 15 and first quarter payments for in 2020 first quarter payments. Connecticut follows New Jersey and it, um, uh, payments for individual and filing for individual partnership and corporation tax returns that would have been due April 15 are now due July 15. And 2020 first and second quarter payments, estimated payments, they're also due now July 15. So um, as, as, we, as we mentioned earlier, um, also the performance of certain time sensitive actions that those have also been postponed. Um, one of the items that we wanna highlight is partnerships. And again, real estate, most of real estate is held in partnerships. A significant amount of our clients hold their real estate in partnerships. And we've seen this as something that's helped our clients. And those are partnerships that are subject to the centralized partnership auto regime. Now, before we take a step forward, let's take a step back. What is a centralized partnership auto regime? And, and as, as you may have know, as you may know, partnerships effective from 2018 and 2019 and forward that are subject to this regime now can no longer file an amended return. So for example, let's let's say a 2017 partnership return needed to be amended. That partnership would simply file an amended return, issue K-1s to the partners, and those partners would then file a 2017 amended return from them, from that side. Partnerships that are now subject to this audit regime can no longer do that. Effectively, if there's some sort of audit adjustment, either due to an error or from an audit assessment, those partnerships are now subject to this regime in where they have to file at the partnership level according to this administrative audit request and pay at the partnership level. So it creates an, another layer of complexity that wasn't there before. Recognizing this, Treasury effectively changed that and gave the option to file amended returns for partnerships which are subject to the centralized partnership audit regime for 2018 and 19 taxable years, but that must be done before September 30th, 2020. So that's a relief and we've seen that being beneficial for a lot of our clients. Another item to highlight is like kind exchanges. Um, we have clients that have started the like kind exchanges. They've, they've sold, sold their, their um, they've sold their, they've sold their uh, relinquished property and now they have their replacement property that they want to close or they want to identify properties. They have now a time frame uh, to do so from that was due between April 1st and July 15. Now that's been extended to July 15. And again, courts are closed, 180 day exchange period. If the courts are closed, you can't, you can't close on that uh, replacement property. So the IRS, Treasury recognized that, we moved that to July 15. Involuntary conversions under 1033. Um, we've seen that out there with our clients. Those deadlines that are due between April 1st and July 15th, those have now been moved to July 15. Uh, another postponement of performing of certain tax sensitive act, um, actions in relation to qualified opportunity zones or opportunity funds. Before we take a step forward, let's take, let's take a step back. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCJA, created an, an investment opportunity in which taxpayers, investors can invest in communities that are economically distressed. Um, there are throughout the country, Puerto Rico has a qualified opportunity zone area. Um, and effectively a taxpayer and investor that has a capital gains or business gains, as we call it section 1231 gains, those gains could be deferred. And the way to do so is that taxpayer investor would roll over the gain, they would contribute the cash to a qualified opportunity fund within a 180 day window after the investment, after the gain has been occurred. So Treasury recognized that this could be a challenging time. So if, if that 180 day window for investment expires between April 1st, 2020 and before July 15, that has been postponed to July 15, 2020. And again, that's something that we sell out with our clients that they want that additional time. So those deadlines have been extended to July 15. Now a qualified opportunity fund um, once they receive their cash, they need to meet so, certain requirements at their level. 
And the way they have to do that is once they get the cash, they need to invest in an operating trader business, either being a real estate trader business or in a non-real estate trader business. And one, of the, and one of the obstacles of doing so is that these types of investments require a significant amount of working capital and construction and building time. So that trader business takes time to once it's purchased, to build it out and then place in service. Recognizing this, Treasury gave Opportunity Funds a working capital safe harbor of 31 months in which they could invest and build out that asset and not incur any sort of negative consequence for the Qualified Opportunity Fund. Again, there's a structuring details that goes be, um, beyond the scope of our presentation. During this time, since we have under federally declared disaster area, the entire country, we, um, our Qualified Opportunity Fund clients have been given additional 24 months to deploy that working capital on top of the 31 months. So that's very good relief. Now, a Qualified Opportunity Fund itself also needs to meet its 90% investment standard. The 90% investment standard looks at the Qualified Opportunity Fund's balance sheet, its assets, and at least 90% of those assets need to be invested in Opportunity Zones. Should a Qualified Opportunity Fund fail to meet that 90% investment standard, they're imposed a non-deductible penalty for each month until it's cured. If a Qualified Opportunity Fund can document execution delays due to COVID-19 during, during this pandemic, then a Qualified Opportunity Fund should consider applying a reasonable cause exception in order not to be subject to that penalty. And that is something that we are working with our clients and we're working with their attorneys um, to get involved with that analysis and the proper planning. Another relief out there under the CARES Act is, is um, in regards to net operating losses for individuals, including estates and trusts and corporations. Uh, individuals and corporations that incur some sort of NOL net operating loss during tax years after 1231, 2017 and before December 31st, 2020, so that will be tax years 20, 2018, 19, and 20, can carry back those operating losses five, five taxable years preceding the year of the loss. Suspends the 80% taxable income limitation for NOL carryovers arising in those taxable years 18, 19, or 20. And there is a, and, and the and the elimination of the LNO, and the elimination of the NOL carryback and the 80% NOL limitation carryover is reinstated, however beginning in December 31st, 2020. So tax years effectively 2021, those relief measures under the CARES Act, they come back. So here's a comparison of what the prior law before the CARES Act under the TCJA for losses arising in tax years beginning after 1231-17 and under the CARES Act and those relief measures. Now, we wanna drive this, this home. And the way we're gonna do this is in the next example. You'll see in this example, we're not considering anything in terms of qualified improvement pro uh, property planning. Um, so in this example, you'll see that uh, this partnership, which um, is projecting that all their partners are at the highest tax rate at this time, at those times, is going to have a million dollar loss for the 2020 taxable year. That 2020 taxable loss, that net operating loss could be carried back and in our situation could be carried back from 2016, 17, 18, file uh, refund claims in the 2021 tax uh, uh, calendar year for 2020 tax losses. And in this situation, in this example, claim a $387,000 refund, NOL refund. George, uh, maybe you want to discuss a little bit in terms of filing uh, current NOLs uh, in terms of our individual and corporate clients. Right. So given the challenges that we're all living through today, the Internal Revenue Service is uh, very much handicapped in processing certain paper returns. These returns would be generally paper returns. So effectively, starting April 17, they, they effectively provided two um, you know, toll-free lines to fax in the information to expedite the refund claims. Form 1139, which is effectively for a business loss carryback, and the form is listed on a slide and form 1045 for an individual carryback the form is listed on a slide these these forms are being received and effectively processed on a more expedited basis as opposed to the normal procedures great so 
let's, let's, let's go a little further. We've talked about the NOLs and how we can carry those back. And there's no limitation in terms of utilizing the 90% limitation. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about qualified improvement property, the retail glitch fix. And we're gonna use this and then use with the NOLs in our next examples to see how we have a, a powerful planning tool. So as originally, as originally intended under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, qualified improvement property would have been 15 year property and eligible for bonus depreciation. This was particularly uh, meaningful for industries such as retail, restaurant, hospitality, because of the rate in which they use, the, the, because of the rate at which these businesses open and renovate their locations. But this intended uh, a boom became a bust since there was a drafting error under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Effectively, qualified improvement property again, uh, became a 39-year asset. So what does that mean? Effectively, an asset that in a real estate in a, or a landlord or tenant's balance sheet could have been depreciated in a faster rate became a 39-year asset, and, and that asset was depreciated over 39 years, much slower rate. The CARES Act corrected the glitch and now it's 15 year recovery period and eligible for bonus depreciation. However, it only applies for improvements that are made by the taxpayer. Also, qualified improvement property is for our, is really for a non-residential commercial clients. It's not, it's not for residential owners and operators. So qualified improvement properties, again, any interior improvement that would be something like replacing drywall, uh, certain certain plumbing, interior doors, fire protection, electrical. What's excluded is improvements related to elevators and escalators, internal structural framework, enlargement of the uh, enlargement of a building. So those costs are not qualified improvement properties. This correction was retroactive to 2018 tax years and forward. So there is a planning opportunity, and we're going to go through that in the next two examples. Now, caveat is some um, states do not follow the federal treatment. And that is something that we really have to analyze because as we've seen now with our clients, certain states are continuing to use the 39 depreciable period or they don't accept bonus depreciation. So although we have a good benefit on the federal side, we got to look at the states and see how, how those states are impacted. So in this example, uh, our client, again, a real estate partnership, they're looking at and seeing what is the benefit right now. They're going to have a million dollar uh, projected loss for 2020. And no sort of analysis is done in terms of qualified improvement property. Um, that for the 2019 tax year, this client will have $600,000 of taxable income, and they're going to pay the tax at 37%, which is the highest rate. Tax due by July 15 for 2019 tax year is $222,000. That million dollar projected loss that comes to fruition in 2020, that loss could be carried back as, NOL, as an NOL carry back. And then under, under this example, as we discussed early, earlier, that's gonna be about $387,000. So our total net benefit, when you're looking at the 2019 and 2020 tax years, and that NOL carry back is about $170,000. Now, using the same example, let's see if we can let's see if we can change the facts and, and we do an analysis and find out that there is qualified improvement property on the balance sheet. In this example, we are able to identify qualified improvement property that was placed in service in 2018 and 2019. 200,000 200, plus 350,000, so about 550,000 dollars of qualified improvement property is on the balance sheet. And we're able to effectively re, um, identify those assets. We have not filed our 2019 tax return. So in this situation, this partnership could file a tax form, the tax form number is 3115, which is a change of method of accounting. And they're able to claim the 2018 and 19 assets um, as part of their bonus depreciation claim on the 2019 tax return. So even though the 2019 property was already placed in service where we file a return, this form allows us to take the, um, that asset that's already been placed in service 2018, that 200,000, 
and we can claim an additional bonus depreciation on the 2019 return. And again, and that was something that came about um, as part of the relief notices from the IRS in terms of how to do this. And that's something that we can help you with if you have this fact pattern. The point is we're able to find an additional deduction on the 2019 tax return of $525,000 in this example. So with that additional deduction, we're able to save our client $195,000 by July 15th. That's real dollars in their pocket. In terms of the NOL claim, that million dollars that we're projecting, we gotta take into account that decrease in terms of the depreciation expense because we already wrote off those qualified improvement property assets. So that effect is a, is a positive 25,000. So our projected loss is reduced from a million to 975. That 975 operating loss, then we can file in, in 2021 for the 2020 tax return, based on the 2020 uh, tax return filing and NOL claims for 2016, 17, and 18. And effectively, we're gonna have about $380,000 refund claim. Our total benefit in this circumstance is $350,000. As a point of comparison, you'll see that if we do no analysis in terms of QIP based on both of these examples, you, the taxpayer is gonna pay $220,000 for, um, for the 2019 tax year due July 15, 2020. If there is um, a QOP analysis done, we're able to reduce that tax amount due by $195,000. The, uh, the 2020 refund claims, that gets reduced slice, uh, slightly because of the depreciation difference by $10,000. Our net tax savings, when taking both examples, is $185,000. And that $185,000 is mostly cash that we're able to claim in the 20. Uh, 19 tax filings, which is due now by July 15, 2020. Uh, another item that we want to talk about, and this was introduced as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, is the business interest limitation. Now, this limitation really for partnerships, and again, most of our clients hold their real estate investments through partnership entities. The, um, this uh, relief doesn't really come into effect for the 2019 tax year, but does come into play for 2020. So let's talk about it now. Start, um, starting effectively 2018, all taxpayers deduction for business interest expense is capped at 30% of its adjusted taxable income for that year. So what is this term adjusted taxable income mean? Effectively means your earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization, that's your EBITDA. The disallowed interest expense, so the amount that's in access to that 30%, is carried forward to the succeeding taxable years. Again, that was the rule due to the TCJA. The CARES Act modified that rule. And, it, and, it, and for partnerships, that modification really comes into effect in the 2020 tax year. But let's talk about how does it affect the 2019 tax year. For partnership, um, for partner, for partnerships to continue to use the 30% of ATI limitation, and the disallowed interest is passed to its partners. At the partner level, there's no changes in terms of 30% ATI limitation. Now, for the 2020 tax year, the partnerships are going to use 50% of its adjusted taxable income limitation, not the 30%. Also, partnerships may elect to substitute the tax um, their 2020 adjusted taxable income for the 2019 adjusted taxable income. And let's think about that for a second, why that's a that's a pretty good election. A lot of our business, a lot of businesses out there are struggling right now. They're, they're because of this COVID-19 business has slowed down. Recognizing this, um, Congress, Treasury said, if we, we have to allow this benefit to occur and the way that has to occur is we're gonna give partnerships this election instead of using their 2020 earnings, which are gonna be much smaller than it was in the past, let's use the 2019 as a substitute. At the partner level, 50% of the 2019 disallowed interest is now 50 automatic, is considered to be automatically paid or accrued. What does that mean? It means that whatever was disallowed from the prior 19 filing, in the 2020 filing, 50% that's carried over you can deduct the remaining 50% of that 2019 disallowed amount 
is carried forward. And, and, and let's, let's look through this in an example to see how, how powerful this is. So in the 2019 tax year, a partnership has taxable income of $100,000. We add back interest depreciation of 100,000 and 50,000. Our total adjusted taxable income is $250,000. 30% limitation of that is 75,000. So 25,000 out of the 100,000 interest amount is disallowed. And the partnership can pass $75,000 as an allowable deduction to the partners. In 2020, the partner will be able to deduct 12,500, i.e. that's 50% of the 25,000 that's related from the 2019 tax year as interest expense um, from um, as interest expense and the other 50%, which is the 12,500, continues to be disallowed. And the remaining uh, will be um, carried forward by that partner. So how can SACS, how can SACS assist you during this time? George. So, um, you know, let, to just um, emphasize the previous example about the adjusted taxable income and a 30 and 50% limitation, a lot of our clients today are, are evaluating whether or not they should be refinancing. So in context of everything we went through on depreciation, whether it be uh, using um, ADS depreciation, which is a longer life, not eligible in certain cases for bonus depreciation, whether or not you wanna use qualified improvement property to effectively take advantage of the bonus depreciation, then wrap that up in the context of paying a prepayment penalty, for example, where that limitation on the interest would effectively be an election that it would make to maintain or provide a new election with that prepayment interest, create a loss by virtue of that prepayment penalty interest payment, carry that back, and then maybe just sacrifice some depreciation going forward and be in a position economically to benefit by virtue of, of today's low interest rates. So I just wanna make sure we're all looking at opportunities to effectively look at it in the right context based on each individual's facts and circumstances. It's an excellent point. All right, to go forward on what we wanted to just bring to everybody's attention is again, First and foremost, review the assets and make sure we're taking advantage of the accelerated depreciation by virtue of the change in the law for qualified improvement property. Determine the best manner in which to do so through a partnership returns, amended returns versus going through the um, relief as an administrative adjustment request. <clears throat> Reviewing those elections um, that were previously made or effectively in the context of returns that haven't been filed yet to determine what would be best suited for, in certain cases, electing out a bonus depreciation, whether we claim a reduced bonus depreciation amount, all these things sensitize the net operating loss carryback claims and, and each individual taxpayer will have certain uh, facts and circumstances that we'd have to sensitize to make sure we're optimizing cash flow, especially in today's environment. Reviewing the state tax treatment to determine whether or not the conformity in terms of the internal revenue code by state is effectively automatically conform or is it statically conform, meaning that they're going to conform as of a given date, which certain states have opted to do so. Other things that we want to bring to everybody's attention, which some of which are obvious, but we just want to reiterate them. You know, obviously everybody's dealing with reduced rent cash flow issues, making sure that we contact our lenders to make sure we're not inadvertently violating any loan covenants and exploring any deferral options that make sense to um, effectively investigate. <clears throat> Going through any loan modifications, uh, we certainly recommend, you know, there are potential tax pitfalls that we want you to contact your SACS number one advisor to make sure if you're going through any kind of modification, every files, any kind of principal curtailment or other forgiveness, please contact us. That is certainly something we want to bring to everybody's attention. Um, as tenants are asking for rent referrals, we need to consider whether or not they have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. So we're advising our clients to ensure they get current financial information to help substantiate that they are in fact neverly impacted 
and then working through the appropriate um, deferral as a case may be that makes sense for the client and for the online tenant. <clears throat> Reaching out to our insurance brokers to review our P&C policies and determine what, if any, um, availability are for business interruption claims. Reaching out to us to ensure that effectively, you know, eligible tenants have taken advantage of the payment protection program. As of uh, Tuesday morning, there's $120 billion still available for the paycheck protection program. All right, so this is our a lot of time for some questions to the extent anybody has. Well, there's a couple that we have. So why don't we go through some of them, Michael? Um, we have George, a question. You, you go ahead. Why don't you, uh, what are some of the questions we got out there? All right, so one question is coming in. Um, I basically filed my return in 2019. And effectively, I elected to be subject to the 163J business interest expense limitation. Could I effectively, is there any relief available to me with, to withdraw that election? That's a great question. Um, and, and there is relief. And yes, the partnership can withdraw from that election by either filing a partnership amended return or an administrative adjustment request. And let's talk a little bit about that because there are some planning opportunities when it comes to that. Qualified improvement property was originally 39 year asset. So when that partnership became subject to that limitation, um, elected out not to be subject to the interest expense limitation, that qualified improvement property became a 40 year asset and couldn't take any bonus depreciation, right? So it really didn't, from a, from a tax, deductibility standpoint, it wasn't that much of a shift in terms of the difference. And any personal property assets could have still taken bonus depreciation. So that wasn't affected as the law is written. With this change, with this fixed qualified improvement property, now there might be a planning opportunity if this is a, a commercial real estate asset that asks the question is, if I want to take an accelerated write-off, qualified improvement property are one of those assets that cannot take bonus depreciation. Even though now it becomes, from an ADS standpoint, a 40-year life, it becomes now 20-year life. So you, it's a, it's a, so it, it could be written off a little bit faster. But you cannot take bonus depreciation. So if there is a planning opportunity, and if the election for, to elect out of the interest expense limitation, again, that election is only available for certain industries. For example, real estate. For real estate, it's available. There is a cost, and that cost is you have to use the slower method of depreciation. You can't take bonus depreciation in certain assets, and one of them is qualified improvement property. So, yeah, we should definitely discuss um, that question specifically to that individual and see if there's a planning opportunity there and if it makes sense to withdraw from that election. I right, agree. Um, all right, another one that popped in here, um, real estate partnership already filed 18 and 19 returns, and they hold qualified improvement properties that were placed in service in both years. Uh, what are our options today um, in terms of CARE Act's relief? Okay, so the partnership can file an amended return for 18 and 19 tax year if the partnership is subject to the centralized partnership audit regime. Um, it has the option again to file an amended return by September 30th, 2020 instead of that um, um, administrative adjustment request. So there is that option there. If that partnership does not want to go through the uh, um, the administrative adjustment request or go through the amended return process for those two years, a third option would be wait for 2020. And in the 2020 tax filing, you can, that partnership could file a 3115. That's the federal form for the change in method of accounting. And they could pick up um, the bonus depreciation related to that qualified improvement property assets in that tax year instead. So there's there's there are multiple options in terms of that specific fact pattern. And again, if they want to accelerate cash flow, it may be better to do amend, the amended return route. If they don't, if they can hold off and they want to wait for whatever reason, they got the option to do it in 2020. Yeah, and again, it, it depends on everybody's facts and circumstances in terms of at least having the information to, to sensitize it and then putting a plan in place, ideally to accelerate that cash flow. Here's one, Michael. Uh, 
What is New York State doing um, in terms of following the provision regarding the qualified improvement property bonus depreciation that has come um, into fruition as part of the CARES Act? Okay. So just off, just just going on in, in terms of bonus depreciation, New York decoupled from federal in t in that regard prior to any changes related to the CARES Act in terms of the qualified improvement retail glitch fix. It, um, New York and New York City effectively for personal income taxes again, and we're talking about personal income taxes, not corporate income taxes, but personal income taxes. Um, for, for changes in the law from the federal side, so changes in related to the Internal Revenue Code, effective March 1st, 2020, and thereafter, what used to be a rolling conformity, meaning New York would automatically conform to, to, the, to the laws based on the Internal Revenue Code, with the exception of certain things that they would decouple, i.e. bonus depreciation, they've changed the position and said, you know what, we're not doing this rolling conformity effective for changes um, from March 1st and forward, we're going to do something called static conformity. Static conformity is basically the, um, the Internal Revenue Code is static. Whatever changes happen, they happen from the federal side. If we conform, then we're going to conform to whatever aspect that we want to do. And again, this is just from the personal income tax side for New York State purposes. From the corporate side, it seems that it is a rolling forward conformity. Okay, um, I think that clarifies that. So, uh, given no more questions, uh, we would like to direct you to the following. As uh, some of you may know, we, we have set up a resource center to deal with all matters, including um, tax relief and other loan, uh, loan programs that are available through Treasury and SBA. So we certainly invite you to utilize our resource center. In addition, we'd like to effectively cordially invite you tomorrow to our ongoing series um, with respect to COVID relief. And tomorrow we have a program where we are effectively presenting preparing for forgiveness, updates on loan options and forgiveness strategies in connection with the Paycheck Protection Program loan. So with that, Michael, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. We certainly want to wish everyone be safe and well, and please contact uh, your number one SACS advisor with any questions. Thank you. Thank you.